introduce our keynote speaker, Sanam Naragi Andalini, who is director of the Center for Women, Peace, and Security at the LSE. Sanam is a globally recognized peace strategist and has for over two decades been working on conflicts, crisis, and violent extremism uh, with a mix of civil society, governments, and the UN. She's the founder and executive director of the International Civil Society Action Network, where she spearheads the Women's Alliance for Security Leadership, which is comprised of independent, women-led organizations active in 40 countries, dedicated to preventing violence and promoting peace, rights, and pluralism. In 2000, Sanam was a civil society leader and drafter of the landmark UN Security Resolution uh, 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security. And in 2011, she was the first senior expert on gender and inclusion on the UN's mediation standby team. She's the author of several publications, including Women Building Peace, What They Do, Why It Matters, which offers a comprehensive cross-regional analysis of women's peace-building initiatives around the world. Her current appointments include serving on the steering board of the UK's National Action Plan on women's, uh, Women, Peace and Security. In December 2019, Sanam received an MBE in recognition for her work and, her, and for services to international peace building and women's rights. Sanam's talk is entitled, Making Wars on Making Peace, a Practitioner's Perspective on the Division of Power from Responsibility in the 21st Century. I'm really excited about this talk, um, which I'm sure will spur a lot of, a lot of thoughts and possibly also some, some debate. So Sanam, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. The negotiations leading to peace are never simple. They're wrapped in history and identity, in the struggle for power, the quest for justice, in personal loss, grief, fear, and uncertainty. In contemporary civil wars and internal conflicts where violence reaches into homes and villages, sometimes pitting neighbors against each other, peace cannot be imposed from above. The burden of peacemaking and peace building must be shared by all members of society. I could go on. Um, this was a pub publication that I wrote in 1998. And I start with this because uh, 22, 24 years on, what we were saying back then, which was the essence of what led us to the Women, Peace and Security Agenda and the role of women in peacemaking and peace building, still resonates, but the world has changed significantly. And I have to tell you that when I was first asked to give uh, this lecture, and I came up with the title, it was before the Ukraine war. So um, it, it's been quite a um, moment of a sort of existential trauma actually thinking about what do I share with you today. But I decided I'm gonna share with you what I know, or at least some of what I know and what I've been involved with, and hope that it can spark a conversation of where we need to go and, and what it means for those of us who are in the practice of peacemaking, but also for those of you who are in academia and are bringing up the next generation of students and, and, and practitioners. So, first question, where are we? What is the state of the world right now? Um, State of the world. A quarter of humanity is living in conflict-affected countries. 84 million people are displaced because of conflict violence and human rights abuses. 274 million people, um, at least, are estimated to need humanitarian assistance this year. And then, amidst all that, we have the issues of COVID-19, climate change, inequalities, cyber threats, um, on online hate speech and so forth that's going on, and of course the, the Ukraine conflict that is now impacting uh, everywhere in, in very strange ways. It's a very different state to when I first started this work because back in the 1990s, we were conscious of the changed nature of warfare. We knew that, for example, civilians were increasingly the targets and, and the battlefields, if you want, had gone from far away places, into homes and villages, as, as, I, as I'd written, but also into, onto women's bodies, the you know, use of rape in Rwanda and Bosnia and so forth, were things that we know about. But it was also a moment where we had a sense of optimism and hope about a peace dividend, about the end of the Cold War, and about a changed way of dealing with, with the world. 22 years on, um, it's a much more dire state of affairs. 
And lest we think that, you know, all of a sudden overnight the, the UN Security Council system has broken down because, you know, Russia is, is reaching all the rules, um, I just wanted to give you a sense of the pictures and, and the flow of where we've been over the last 20 years. So back in the 1990s, we had Russia's war in Chechnya. Look at the, look at the devastation. It's very similar to what's happening in Ukraine X number of years later. But we've also had the Iraq war and the use of thermobaric bombs and, and phosphorus and others by the United States, by our allies here, I mean, in, in Iraq, in, in uh, um, Israel, using it in Gaza and so forth. Um, the mother of all bombs, the US dropping that on Afghanistan. Uh, we don't even know what damage that did, but it was the largest bomb that was dropped short of a nuclear weapon back in 2016. When Russia got involved in the, Ukra in the uh, Syrian conflict back in 2015, I was working with my Syrian colleagues, and they said, what do you think is going to happen? And I said, well, we need to look at Chechnya to tell you what, what is going to happen. And, and again, the pictures of Aleppo show you that. And then there's Libya and Yemen and, and so forth. So when we look at the Security Council, I, for a long time I've been calling it the Unsecurity Council as opposed to the UN Security Council because every single member of the P5 has been involved in perpetrating war and, um, and actually not upholding the responsibility that they were given by the world. So this is, this is one issue that I have, that the powerful are abrogating their responsibility to the rest of us. And then there's another aspect to this, and, and th this is where things get complicated, that every war you look at, it's not just one war. It's maybe one territory, but within it immediately, all sorts of other kinds of conflict arise. So uh, the colors are slightly uh, strange because they look like happy colors, but actually um, the n problems that we see. So you might start with a state civil society conflict, say in Syria. Immediately it becomes a regional conflict because Saudi Arabia and Iran think, hey, we can deal with each other there. It becomes a superpower, proxy war, Russia and US. It becomes a US-Iran war, right? So you get all these things. I was talking to my Syrian colleagues back in 2012 and they said in the next six weeks we're gonna see extremist forces coming into play within the Syrian context because they are providing bread for people and the international community is not. We saw the rise of ISIS, so extreme, the weaponization of identity and violent extremism comes in. Organized crime comes in, obviously, you know, whether it's trafficking oil, uh, antiquities, people, etc. And then the sexual violence that, that permeates all these things. So, so every context we look at, if there's a complexity of conflict that, that's happening, and the longer the war goes on, the more these things become intractable. And so what we've had in the last 20 years is that we've become very good at starting wars, but actually not very good at preventing or ending them. And this to me is, is the biggest question. Why is that? Why is it that if you look back at the context of Ukraine from, 2000, from the 1990s and then 2007 and 2008 all the way up to 2014 and so forth, the warning signs were there of what the Russian red lines were, or what they wanted. Now, whether we like the way the Russians behave or not, whether we think they're authoritarian or not, that is almost beside the point. The point is that we as the rest of the world, as NATO, as the United States, as the West, etc., what were we doing in terms of diplomacy? Where was the radical diplomacy that was needed? Where was the $2 billion that could have been spent in diplomacy, which is now handed over like candy in terms of weapons? Right. It's the question of responsibility of preventing wars. Where does it sit and why doesn't it happen? In my experience, and I, and I say this from um, on the one hand being involved in the practice on the ground with colleagues and, and, and women peace builders around the world, and I'll talk, talk to you about that in a minute, but also working at the UN doing research and so forth. So I've always kind of been margin, on the, always on the edges and margins of different sectors but observing it from, from different angles. I see a few different things, and I just wanted to run through them with you in terms of why is it that, that we seem to be so good at starting wars and not so good at preventing them. So conceptually, it seems that in the age of the American empire, um, and America as the sole superpower, 
uh, the doctrine of war seems to, and violence of strength seems to dominate. So instead of thinking that the logic should be, if there's a problem, first we go at it diplomatically and we put every effort into it to try and resolve it through negotiations and talks and so forth, um, and then if that's not possible, we impose economic sanctions, and then if that's not possible, we go to war, if we have to, as war is the last resort. Actually, what you see in the last 20 years with the US as a dominant force is that where they've been able to go to war first, that's been the first choice. Iraq is a classic example of that, right? And, and the irony is that next door with Iran, it's the opposite of that. Because once they went to war with Iraq and got stuck there, waging war on Iran became a much more costly and dangerous issue. So what happened? They imposed sanctions. And then sanctions didn't work. And then what happened? They sat down to negotiate. If it had been the other way around, the situation with Iran would be very different, and the situation with Iraq, I think, would have been very different. Right? But it's been the logic of, we go in with violence. And, and sadly, what we see with that is that it's not, not only going in with violence, but it's going in with um, kind of the privatization of war. So with, in the context of the Iraq war, you had the, the US Army going in, but it was so much also driven by the companies that were making billions out of it. By the time you get to the Libya war, it was a different story, actually. It was, well, we don't want to send our soldiers to fight in Libya. We'll just outsource it. We'll do it from above, you know, with our drones and our planes and so forth, NATO. Um, but we'll outsource the ground troops, quote unquote, to our colleagues, the UAE and the Qataris and so forth. And what did they do? They brought in their militias. And so Libya has become a chaotic space of extremist forces and three governments at various points and, and, and so forth and so on. So, so it, it's been privatization and outsourcing of, of, of conflict. So this, this in itself is a problem, that why are we not thinking about dialogue and diplomacy as the first choice. And why is it the dialogue and diplomacy are perceived as weaknesses? When, when uh, President Trump dropped the mother of all bombs on Afghanistan, no lesser person than Farid Zakaria on CNN said, now he looks presidential. And the question is, why do you look presidential dropping a massive bomb on one of the poorest countries in the world? Why is that presidential? So we have this problem. The second issue, when we think about this, and, and now I'm kind of bringing it down in terms of conceptually, um, wh again, where I sit and what we see in, in practice is what is peace? What is security? Who defines these things? What is it that happens when we say, oh, there are peace talks going on, peace negotiations? Who's defining that? And there's a big conceptual clash or contradiction that happens because when I'm sitting with my UN colleagues and they're thinking about these things, it's very short term framing and it's very much around conflict management. You know, let's kick the can down the road. I remember sitting in a room while the Syria conflict was flaring up and, uh, and the discussions were happening and we were looking at it regionally and, and what are the solutions and so forth. And, and it was, and I said, at some, I said to my colleagues, I said, well, I think that we need to engage Iran on this and think about what are the incentives to give to Iran to engage and be, be constructive on the Syria file as opposed to um, also sidelining them? And, and, and my colleague said, oh, you know, you want to make the problem bigger than it is. And I said, no, the problem is bigger than it is. It's whether we are willing to acknowledge it. Anyway, the conversation went on. And finally, there was a moment when somebody said, well, you know, what we need to do is freeze the violence and unfreeze the politics. This is hashtag language. It's great. Fantastic, yes, let's freeze the violence and unfreeze the politics, but that's not enough. You need to look at the bigger picture and you need to look at what the motives and incentives and, and so forth are. And when you bring that sense of what the negotiations should be about from the highest levels, where as I say, it's, it's sometimes driven by the role of the mediator and you know, whether their ego wants them to sort of think that they're coming up with a solution and, and possibly a Nobel Prize, but limits, the, limits uh, the, 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 the discussions. When you look at it from that lens and then you look at it from the ground lens and you hear from people on the ground, what is it that they want from their peace talks? It's very different concepts of peace and security. In the case of Afghanistan, if you ask the Afghan women for the years and years and years that many of us were working with them, they were saying, we want to be at the tables of negotiation. We know the Taliban. 
We know what they represent. We want to be there to address not only women's rights, but peace for our country there. And they were kept out, and they were excluded, and they were marginalized, and, and so forth. And what happened? The US sat with the Taliban in Doha. The international community came and sat with, with the Taliban in Doha. They agreed that there would be no attacks on NATO forces. They agreed to release 5,000 Taliban fighters. Was there any discussion of protection of civilians, protection of women's rights? They were having these discussions and these negotiations as the Taliban was bombing maternity clinics and, and schools. So whose peace, whose security, and who gets to decide, who gets to sit at the table? These are, these are some of the problems that, that, that um, I deal with. And then another aspect in all of this is what are the values we stand for? What's happened to us, us as the Western liberal forces? Do we stand for human rights? Do we stand for democracy? Do we stand for universal rights? What is it that we stand for? Because in the last 20 years since, since the 9-11 attacks, and again, the dominance of the, of the US discourse with, with the UK's help and others, um, so much of the framing of the engagement with the world has been around what we're against. The war on terror. We're against terrorism, yes. Countering terrorism, countering violent extremism, then it became preventing violent extremism, PV, from CT to CVE to PV. But if you ask, well, what are we for? Because if in the name of countering terrorism we have gone and bombed people, and, and we are attacking people in Yemen and Libya and Syria and, and, and elsewhere, we're actually fostering more terror. You, you, you drop a bomb on, on a wedding party in Yemen and you kill 40 people, you've created God knows how many more people who want revenge or vengeance. And are they the terrorists or are we the state sponsors of terror? So what, and, and bottom line, what do we stand for? And, and again, I'll come to this on the question of uh, what happened with Afghanistan. The second is what I, what I mentioned earlier, the division of power and responsibility. Over and over what I'm seeing is that the powerful are just not taking on the responsibility to protect. We have an agenda that came out in the 1990s called responsibility to protect. The idea behind it was that if a state is, not, is, is attacking its own civilians, then the international community has the responsibility to engage and try and protect civilians. What we're seeing is a complete dissociation of power and responsibility these days. So not only, we're, as I said, we're starting the wars, but we're not actually taking responsibility for those who need to be looked after. And the question is, who is taking on that responsibility? And in my work, what I've seen is that it's women, women on the ground who are, who are doing it, women who become peace builders in their communities. And, and um, again, I'll, I'll give you some examples of that coming. The second aspect of this, which is, which is interesting um, in, the, in the context of negotiations and, and the essence of international mediation efforts is that there's a principle of the hurting stalemate. Um, and again, the idea there is that yes, once you have parties in a war, if they reach a point where there's a stalemate, neither side winning, but they're both hurting, then that's ripe for negotiations. That's the time they'll come to the table and, and, and negotiate some compromise. Again, when we look at it on, on the ground, the reality is that they're, the wars are happening, but those who are waging the wars, those who are benefiting from the wars, aren't necessarily the ones on the, on the ground. They don't have their assets or their families or their, they're not even themselves on the ground to hurt. It's other people who are hurting. So, for example, when I was with the UN in the context of Somalia, there were negotiations. We went to Garraway, it was in the middle of a famine, um, and Various political parties and, and clans, five clans, they're negotiating and so forth. And everybody wanted a piece of the government. Everybody was, they were negotiating for their percentage in, in, in the federal government and in the, and in the uh, parliament. There was a famine going on. And the discussion and the discourse at, with the international community and, and the sort of the language that we use in, in political science and so forth is power sharing. And I was sitting there and I kept saying, what about responsibility sharing? Why are we not reframing these discussions and saying, you, Mr. So-and-so, you want to become finance minister and you want to become minister of, I mean, a prime minister and you want to become president of this state and so forth. People are dying, there's a famine, there's no water. If you want to become that, take on that role, you have a responsibility to provide those resources for your people. And yet, that discussion is just not there. 
we're constantly talking about power sharing and we're talking often to people, people who come to these negotiations, often who literally do not live there. They have two different passports in their pockets. So if something goes wrong, they've got their Canadian passport and they can leave Somalia and go back to Canada. So are the who's hurting? Who's, and, it's, and it's ordinary people on the ground who are hurting. And, and oh, repeatedly now what we're seeing with the wars is that actually it's children. 30% of the victims of the Yemen war are children. So we're killing our future. When you look at Afghanistan, over 60% of the population is under the age of 25. Over 40% are under the age of 14. So this is what we abandoned there. And, these were the, and we didn't have anybody at the tables of negotiation representing their interests and concerns. We, our folks sat and cared about our soldiers, the Taliban. We enabled the Taliban to represent 50% of, of the country. We gave them what they wanted and we got out. And now we're saying, Sorry, Afghans, your fault. Can't come out, won't give you your money, you know, and, and Afghan women, we love you very much, we'll give you an award, but we're really not doing very much for you. This leads me to the, to the question on, on sort of substan substantively and, and um, kind of technical work that's going on. So the, along with this kind of hurting stalemate theory, the other aspect of this is that elite bargains matter. But elite bargains don't work in the conflicts that we're talking about, precisely because of the complexity on the ground. Just because you get, an, you get elite bargains at the top doesn't mean that actually they hold. And yet we're constantly doing this. Meanwhile, the, the, the um, research, all of our research shows that when you have inclusive processes, when you have civil society present, when you have women's movements present in peace processes, not only the chance of the negotiations being um, uh, substantively more uh, strong are, are there, but it's also that they hold for longer. Why? Because people hold their own actors accountable, and yet we're not doing it internationally. Expertise is, is seriously undervalued, and I, and I just wanted to come to the sort of the logistical side. It's amazing how resources are limited for peacemaking and peacebuilding. Access and attention, access to power holders, attention on issues is limited. And then what I see repeatedly in the last, as I say, 20 odd years, is that we work with different governments and they come along and, and many of them you know, will wave the flag of women, peace and security and we have many, many states right now that have uh, women, peace and security national action plans. 51% of UN member states for that matter. But because our bureaucracies are designed so that people change jobs every three or four years, we are constantly dealing with people who are generalists who yesterday were dealing on trade and today all of a sudden they've been thrown into dealing with Afghanistan or dealing with women, peace and security and, and instead of building and having specialization, it's as if we're constantly at a very general basic level and nothing gets moved. So these are some of the challenges of why we're good at starting wars but not, um, not doing a great job of ending them. So where do we come in and the women, peace and security agenda? Um, Again, going back 20, you know, going back to 1990s and, and, and to, uh, you know, back to 2000, it was women on the ground understood the complexity of war. They were living with it. If you looked at Northern Ireland, if you looked at Guatemala, Israel, Palestine, Bosnia, Rwanda, we were seeing the different dimensions of how these, the complexity of war and how it's coming into people's homes and societies, impacting women and women's reactions to that. Um, we were also seeing that there's this link between human security and state security, right? That, that you can't deal with just states if what's happening on the ground is people, as in Sierra Leone, people were being, kids were being um, kidnapped, hands were being chopped, um, they were being forced into drugs and then becoming militias on the ground. So, so there was a kind of dimension of these societal wars that target civilians is the new wars that, is a new phenomenon of, of war that, that we have to deal with. And women's voices were coming out and saying, look, number one, we see things, we see the signs. Number two, women are often the first responders, they're the first humanitarian actors that are, that are there. Every time we think about a humanitarian setting or an IDP setting, or if you, if you look at the pictures of, of, of what's happening with Ukraine right now, it's women and children, but it's women looking after children. They're having to make decisions about where do they go and what, how do they feed them and how do they raise the money and which bus do they take. They're constantly, they're not passive victims, they're having to make choices. It's the same if you're a, 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 a Sudan, you know, Sudanese or in Darfur, in Chad, elsewhere, if you've been displaced and you're now living under tarpaulin and having to think, do I go and get firewood or do I not? 
how do I get the blanket, and so forth. So they're making, people are making these decisions. They're, they're, they're there and, and uh, have agency. Similarly, in my work, what I've been looking at is the women who actually become peace, peacemakers and peace builders, the ones who not only run to the problem, but start to say, well, if I need to get humanitarian aid in, I have to talk to the Houthis in Yemen or negotiate with the Boko Haram here. And, and they use their own sociocultural roles to do that. So they're, they're actually actors in the context of conflict. They happen to be non-state, unarmed actors, but they're actors and agents. Another dimension of this is women as fighters. We've seen this repeatedly in, in, in liberation wars and others, that women pick up arms and they want to be part of the process. But also what we started seeing in the 1990s is that as, they, um, as the disarmament and demobilization processes happen, those women get set aside. So for example, in the case of South Africa, when the ANC came to power, there was the MK. The MK was the armed entity of, of, of the ANC. Many of the women who had been fighters for the MK ended up in prostitution because they were completely erased out of the politics and, and, the, and the positions that were given to them. If you look at Northern Ireland, there are posters of women who were leading protest movements, and then, but it's always the men behind them who took the, the positions of power. So there are women who have been part and parcel of the fight as fighters, as guerrilla forces and so forth, but they get lost in the, in the mix when it comes to disarmament, especially when it comes to disarmament and demobilization. And then, of course, we have victims and survivors, people who have been raped, people who have, um, who, in many contexts, they were the mothers and the sisters and the daughters of those who were disappeared, and they went to look for them. And in the process of searching for their male kith and kin, they ended up getting raped and abused. These are, these are situations that we've seen in Peru and elsewhere. So it's victimization on multiple levels that are there. But if we don't have a gender lens when we're doing transitional justice, they get erased out of the mix as well. So these things were happening. These were in the 1990s. We were seeing a lot of these things. And, and one of the things that for me has been interesting is that what, the minute we start talking about women and women's experiences, the first thing that happens is somebody says, oh, what about widows? What about young women? What about the men? It's almost as if through the lens of women, we begin to see humanity and human experience of conflict and war. And certainly in my own work, having done the uh, work around women, the sort of women's experiences, I did a 10 country study on what's going on with young men. Because we just assume that young men are somehow hyper-masculine, violent, cartoon characters. But actually when you talk to them and you understand what fears they go through and, and what happens to them, it's, it's, there's levels of vulnerability that need to be addressed and how they get exploited um, that nobody really wants to address because we need them to be fighters, right? They're the first ones to be taken, to be soldiers, to be militias, and, and, and so forth. So it's, it's this, this agenda has helped us bring the human experience into those spaces of the Security Council where so far the unit of analysis has been the state and it's almost humanity doesn't exist. And it's a big fight um, because China and Russia don't want that. Every time we're back in there, every year that we're back in there, if you look at the way that they address the, the, the discourse, they're trying to push it back while the rest of the world is trying to sort of nudge it forward and bring this, this human's lens. So this agenda, what's been, what's been happening? We have 10 Security Council resolutions, 51% of member states have national action plans. The EU, the OSCE, the AU, all of them have resolutions and, and policies. This is the classic um, kind of women overachieving their homework uh, example. We have dotted every I, crossed every T, done the research, done the policy, worked with the governments, tried to work from the inside and, and outside and, and you know, avoid naming and shaming and so forth. Um, and over the years, we've had a consensus and, and, a, and a sort of a body of member states that, that have come along and, and are beginning to understand this. And the agenda has expanded with the, with the problem. So it has in it the prevention of war. As, as a premise, the importance of participation of women and gender responsiveness in, in, in peace processes, protection of women, prevention of sexual violence, the importance of having peacekeeping missions that have men and women um, sh serving together, all the issues around post-conflict recovery, um, cultural dimensions of education and environment and, and, and so forth, prevention of violent extremism because it's got a gender dimension, and then protection of peace builders because now as peace builders they're becoming more um, more at risk. So on paper, we have the most extraordinary agenda for peace imaginable, on paper. In practice, what's happened 
is that so much of this has been taken on by civil society. And this is a picture of my network, the Women's Alliance for Security Leadership. We have partners in 40 countries, 91 peace, uh, women-led peace-building organizations, over 160 individuals are members. And these are people who are literally on the ground, if I, if I point to, to various ones, there's Mosarat on, in beige standing next to me. She she's, works in Pakistan. Um, she's been doing uh, de-radicalization of Taliban in Pakistan. Uh, Visaka Dharmadasa in the sari, in the red sari next to me, she, was, she led a delegation of mothers of um, missing servicemen in Sri Lanka to talk to the Tamils. They were the first ones to go in and, and, and engage in dialogue and then set the stage up for ceasefire negotiations. And she's continuing to do her work. Um, we have the lady in, in the white scarf with the glasses at the back. That's um, Soraya. She's from Kenya. She's been doing police cafes in Kenya, providing a space for families, Kenyan women and men, but Kenyan women who ha have somehow become embroiled with al-Shabaab, whether their brothers or husbands or fathers have gone and they went and followed, but providing a safe space for them to come back and, and talk to, to, um, uh, to, the, to the local authorities. But pretty much every single one of these people that's in that picture is doing something extraordinary on the ground. My colleague, um, Rodolfo, who's on the, with the beard, he's one of the few men that, that's there, he, um, he deals with femicide cases in Mexico. Uh, few behind him, uh, Wahid is Kashmiri. He is now sitting in jail in Kashmir because he was doing peace building work. So it's a risk. What these people do is incredibly risky work. And what we've tried to do is create an alliance so that they can come together. And, and the, the approach for me has been that we need to think about people in terms of the personal support they need for their solidarity, professional support, meaning whether it's opportunities for training and courses and so forth, but also fellowships and, um, and recognition, awards and so forth. So every year we, we, we nominate people for, their, for awards. And then institutional support. We started a fund called the Innovative Peace Fund with the idea of channeling resources directly into their hands. Um, and I call it investing in trust. Because when you have people on the ground doing this work, they have built up a, a vast amount of trust in their own communities. And that's not something that as outsiders you can do flying in and flying out. So for us, it's this question of saying, you're on the ground, you know what's needed, I need to get the resources to you for you to, to enable you to do the work yourself. So, so that this, this shifting the balance and in many ways de decolonizing, if you want, the space for um, peace building and, and development. Um, this is a big poster, it's a wall poster, and, and what we did uh, two, two years ago was we asked people to give us three moments in their story of how they became peace builders and, and what incidents came up. And it's really, if, if, it, it's, it's hard to, maybe it's too big right now there, but if, if you read it, you'll see so many little moments of incidences, people who had their children who may have died because of terrorist attacks and they became involved, others who saw their communities destroyed and they ran to, to do, as I say, humanitarian aid. And then, and then the, the essence of how they got involved in passing laws and legislation and taking from the local and taking it up to the, to the global. So there is a universe of people on the ground who are doing all of this work. And our, my job, in a way, has been to be, be the bridge between them and the international community and, and, and um, the in spaces of, uh, that make the decisions that affect their lives. So what is it that, that they bring to that? What's the difference in terms of how we see it? And, and if, we, if we call it politics from the margins, I'm like, is it margins or mainstream? Is it on the, you know, is it on the ground? Or where, where, where do we situate people who are living with the daily reality? So um, number one, it's very simple. People are saying, we want the war. We don't want violence. We want nonviolent resolutions to conflict institutions, systems, and so forth. And the agenda isn't just about equality, because so much of this when it went in the United States became about women in the security forces. Status quo, you know, we, we now have equal rights to go and kill and, and, and maim and, and be killed. The agenda of women, peace, and security is that actually we want the wars to stop because we don't want our men and boys to either, to, to be forced into fighting either, right? So it's a transformative equality. There is a constant refrain, and I say refrain and constant because I've heard it from my colleagues in Israel and Palestine back in the 1990s, and now, and then I hear it from my colleagues in um, uh, Syria and elsewhere, that the attitude is, we want to talk. We will talk. We will not shoot. My Syrian colleagues were saying, everyone is helping us kill each other. No one is helping us talk to each other. 
And again, you think about that in terms of the resources and energy that goes into ne negotiations and diplomacy and spaces for dialogue versus the energy and resources that goes into let's give them a bomb and let's, let's, let's give them the missiles and, and, and so forth. So there, there is a huge discrepancy there. They see peace talks as a moment to be able to not only deal with historic past, but also transform the future, to rethink it. So when Northern Irish women went to the peace table, um, they brought up questions of education. Well, how are we going to educate the next generation about our past? They brought up issues of police reform and prison reform. How do you have a police force when the police has been, in a way, the force of repression for at least part of the community? How do you create these? So, so it's not just, again, it's not just about the power sharing and the politics and, and, and name calling. It's really about thinking about a new society that, that, that you create together. They talk about and, and take on the responsibility to protect. I have a colleague in, in South Sudan, and, and she said, she was talking about the South Sudan story once, and she said, you know, in South Sudan, women don't have time to die. And we asked her, what do you mean? And she, sa she said, well, the young men are busy killing each other. Our elders are busy devastated by what's happened to their society. The old men are just getting sick and just out of depression and just, you know, dying. And the women, are left to care for people. So in the morning they get up and they have to think about where they get the food and the water and the cooking and how do you look after the maimed and how do you look after the sick and how do you look after, they literally don't have time to die. And, and that to me is, is one of the sort of, again, it, it's, it's a refrain we see over and over that they're constantly taking on this responsibility to protect. When, with the COVID pandemic, what we saw with our partners was that the world forgot about Yemen and Syria and Iraq and all these places, right? But they were there, and, and of course, COVID came. And, and what we did at ICANN was we channeled all of the resources that we had, uh, that we planned for meetings and, and workshops and so forth. We said, okay, all of this is going to go to the ground. Um, let's see how our, what, let's see whether we can support our partners. They took that money, and because they had had the trust before in terms of being interlocutors with government and marginalized communities and so forth, that that essence of trust. They took the resources that we gave them and they became the providers of COVID health and hygiene and food bags and making masks. And, and when the WHO was talking about washing your hands with soap and water, my Cameroonian colleagues were saying, we don't have soap and we don't have water. And the Somalis were saying, we can't afford soap. And, and in Yemen, they were saying, we don't have water. And so we, would, we created a WhatsApp group and they were talking to each other about how do you make soap from natural products and you know, from a little bit of alcohol and from plants and how else do you, what else can you do? So they became the ones who took on the responsibility to protect. When food was short in, in, in Turkey, one of our Syrian partners who's been running a women's center, she started doing food bags for the Syrians in, in her community. And the local authority, the local Turkish authorities came to her and said, actually, we have Turkish families also that, that are poor and, and can't afford food. Can you help them? And so she became the purveyor of resources. And then we found that, of course, there was massive, massive, massive levels of domestic violence. And again, our partners were the ones who were knocking on people's doors and saying, what, what's happening? And why are you doing this? So this issue of whatever comes on, these are people, it's almost like a it's like a, I sometimes imagine it as, as a picture of somebody with multiple hands and multiple balls being dropped, but it's the burden is just increasing and increasing and increasing on the least powerful, those with the least resources. And yet those who sit at the top, where are they? Um, another aspect of this is what I mentioned earlier, the peace, you know, we want peace actors at the peace talks. Right now, the model that we have is that if you are violent enough, that's your ticket to the peace talks. So the logic in the case of Afghanistan or Yemen or elsewhere for the women would have been to become really violent. But that's not what they want to do because they want to change things, right? And that's not the norm for, their, for any of us, frankly, to, to suddenly say, okay, we're going to go and blow ourselves up or blow up you know, and, and become spoilers. So this logic of why can't we have peace actors at our peace tables is something that um, is critical, and it's related to this question of responsibility sharing that I, that I mentioned before, which itself is related to how do we redefine peace? How do we think about holistic peace, not just elite bargains? How do we redefine security so that we're looking at human security and national security? These are not people who are um, ideal, sort of naive, if you want, around national security. People understand you need an army and you need a police force, but should your police force be a force of oppression or should it be a force of trust and and social cohesion. 
and, and we know how to do community policing. So are my colleagues the ones who get involved in, in this kind of work? Justice and reconciliation. How do you have justice and reconciliation? These are the challenges that, that, that people are looking at. And, and the whole essence of what does it mean to be gender responsive in your, in your processes of, of response when you're doing humanitarian aid right now in the case of Afghanistan. You know, how do we make sure that women are getting access to food if they're widows? And the rules by the, the, that the Taliban has set is that you can't leave the house without uh, a male guardian. Right? So we, we, if, if we as an international community are involved in purveying humanitarian aid, this has to become standard practice. It's, if we know that sexual violence is, becomes part and parcel of conflict, what are our humanitarian agencies doing as a strategy for the prevention of sexual violence? Right? This, this is not rocket science, and yet it's not being done. And then finally, what I find really interesting about, about the work of, of, of my colleagues and, and, and so forth is that they bring a certain moral authority from the ground up, but they're, they're not just relying on the law. They are drawing on culture, they're drawing on religion, they're drawing on faith. I have you know, colleagues who will turn, if, if they're being told that Islam says jihad and jihad is violent, they're the ones who turn around and say, no, jihad isn't spilling blood on the streets. Jihad is going and giving blood in the hospitals. So they're reframing and drawing on their own culture, culture and tradition to foster peace and, and situate a culture of peace that is, that is sort of the essence of, the, uh, of their own societies, but, but somehow has been forgotten. Because the tendency is to look at the world and say, oh, over there they're violent. The Middle East is violent. You know, we are not, but over there they are. But it's, it's reframing it and, of course, um, taking away a lot of the racism, I think, which, which is inherent to those kinds of discourses. What's happened? Um, we have great, as I said, we have great practice, we have great research, we have, um, we have processes where we've been inclusive of women and, and it's been really extraordinary in terms of the steps that, that, that uh, have been achieved. Um, in the Yemen National Dialogue, they had 30% women. In, in the Somali process that I was involved in, we got some really great language in the peace agreement about the participation and, and inclusivity of women and young people and professionals in the Constituent Assembly and so forth. So, these processes, you have, you know, negotiations happen, a document comes out. Well, if you don't implement the document, what's the point? Right? And yet this is what happens repeatedly. That not, not one single one of the peace agreements that has been signed in the last 20 odd years has actually been implemented fully. And the assumption is that, oh, once we sign on paper, that's it. Peace is there. No, that's just a promise of peace. It's the hard work comes in the aftermath. And with the, with the agenda on women, peace and security, what we've seen is what I call the AAA syndrome of apathy, ad hocery, and amnesia. There is a lot of apathy because there, there are, not only there aren't that many incentives in the bureaucracies and, and, and in terms of the leadership um, uh, of our you know, foreign services in terms, of, in terms of keeping their promises, but there's, there, is, there, are no, um, there's no disincentive. So if you don't do it, nothing happens to you. You still get promoted, you still move on, so it's easy to be apathetic. Ad hocery is the next one. Um, as I say, lots of good things, but instead of building on the good practices and moving, for, moving it forward, it happens, that, you know, it, it's so personalized. One person comes in, they want to do some good work, and then they move on, and, and, and then we get amnesia. So it's, it's a repeated cycle of, of, the, of, this, of this syndrome, which, is, which has been um, a real problem at our governmental level. As I say, meanwhile, in civil society, there's been extraordinary uh, push and, and, and development. But then, and this, this is where I you know, was a moment of pause for all of us, is, is what happened with Afghanistan. We saw the Taliban coming. We knew what would happen. Our government stonewalled Afghan women from the Doha talks. The withdrawal process started. Women peace builders, women police officers, women security officers, they were not evacuated. In fact, many of them didn't have a chance, not only didn't have a chance to go out with a formal, you know, with the, with the international actors, but if we saw the pictures at the airport, they weren't going to go to the airport with their families and kids to get crushed, to get sexually abused and so forth. So they got left behind. And what we've seen over the last six, seven months, and, I've, and I got involved in this because we had Afghan partners and they kind of came to us for help. And we thought that we would be able to come to the British government or the Canadian government or the Germans or others to say, hey, you all, pledged to support women peace builders. UK government, you took a report to the Security Council 
we developed guidance together around how to protect women peace builders. And, well, here they are. And these are people, by the way, that were funded with UK aid, many of them. So we have a direct connection. We know who they are. We know who their families are. We have them listed in databases and so forth and so on. Help us get them out. Eight months, nine months on, not one single one of those people has made it to the UK. We as an organization became involved in the business of evacuating, um, finding flights, finding visas, finding safe houses, getting money in um, for over 2,000 people. 559 families, 62% had female principals, meaning there was the women who were the lead actors and who were most at risk because of the work that they were doing before. NATO took pictures with all the women police officers and, and army folks. The UN funded them. Um, Turkey and Japan, you know, were very proud of training Afghan police officers. 3,797 of them. Not one single one of them was protected. And they are now in hiding. We don't know what's happened to many of them. So the entire kind of facade of our governments talking about women's rights, human rights, etc., suddenly started to crumble. And then it got worse because what did we hear? We've all, we've all heard this. We, had, we rescued cats and dogs. 200 cats and dogs came out, right? Cobbles, stray cats and dogs. Got to get out. But when we said, what about women peace builders? It's still a problem. So how do we, as the Western liberal order, hold up our face and stand up tall and say, hey, we stand for human rights. This is a big question for us, right? So that's a big part of the kind of implications of what happened with, with the way Afghanistan withdrawal was done. And as I say, it's the negotiations. I don't, I don't, I'm not one of these people to say, we need to have, we should have kept the military there forever and ever. What I say is that the politics should have been done right. And if we had enabled the processes for Afghans to talk to each other, for the women especially to be there, systematically through the Doha talks, things could have been very different. Another aspect of, of what's happened in the, in the, with the um, withdrawal from Afghanistan is that we now have a resurgence of the transnational identity-based violent extremists. So whether it's jihadi movements in Philippines and Indonesia and elsewhere, people are looking to the Taliban and saying, hey, look, they did it. They were patient, they were violent, they figured it out. In the Philippines, my colleagues are saying that a, a law based on, um, uh, to, to to ban child marriage is now being challenged by Islamist clerics because they're saying the Taliban says it's okay, it's according to Islam, right? So there is multilateralism, they are talking to each other, but it's, we have enabled the, the resurgence of this. And think about it in terms of, again, from, a, from the standpoint of the British Army or the US Army and others, all the soldiers who were sent there who came back traumatized and maimed and, 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 and died to fight the Taliban and to fight terrorism. And, and we've given, not only sort of enabled the resurgence of the Islamists, but, but we're also seeing it in terms of other forms of extremism. White supremacy in the US is on the rise. Hindu nationalism is on the rise. I, I don't know whether you saw just yet, just last night, uh, another mosque was, was attacked in, in, in India. So this weaponization of identity is on the resurgence. And then the third part of this that, that you know, nobody really wants to, again, talk about, it's slightly embarrassing, is that there's a bolstering of authoritarian states. And the idea that NATO was beaten, NATO was beaten in Afghanistan, right? And I don't think that, that Russia's war on Ukraine is accidental I, 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 in terms of its timing. I think it's come about because of what was happening in Afghanistan. It, it, was, a, it was a slow burn. There were many, many different issues that, that were going on. But the fact that there was a moment where it's like, okay, so what are they gonna do? And, and giving, giving, um, giving Putin the, the kind of impetus to, to, to carry on and kind of challenge the West um, as, as he's been doing. So, and, and of course, Ukrainians are paying the price, right, for, for the failure of diplomacy. So, so this is, these are, these are we're, we're at a moment where our world is very broken, and I'm sorry to sound so, so pessimistic, um, not only because of all the things that have happened, but also because of the depth of racism that has come about as a result of it. The world is looking and saying, oh look, they, look at Europe, it's, it's taking in Ukrainian refugees, but look at what they did with Afghan refugees and others. So, so there, that, that sort of, again, that, that 
sense of moral authority that might have existed, I think, uh, and, and, the, and the, the curtains have been kind of pulled and, and we're seeing um, a lot of um, division. What I find troubling is that when, when I have these conversations, acknowledging mistakes is just something that our governments and our politicians don't want to do. And I, and I think that actually if we want to move forward, we need to figure out where did we go wrong? What did we, do? you know, okay, that side, there are some bad things that are done by authoritarian states and dictators and so forth, by, by extremist movements. But what have we also gone? Where did we go wrong? Why is it so hard to have a conversation about, an honest conversation about our own weaknesses and challenges? It's, it's an issue. Um, I'd like to see more humility and empathy in our politics and foreign policy. There's a tendency to not see the other as ourselves. It's, these are, you know, what's the difference between those of us who are here and those, those who are trying to get, you know, flee Ukraine or, 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 or women or girls in Afghanistan who want to go to university and school and, and, and can't go. They are us, but we don't see each other in that way. Um, I say all these things and often people say to me, oh, but you know, you shouldn't say these things. It's, it's a dangerous world out there. But I also think that uh, to the extent that we still have freedom of expression, it's not just a right, it's a responsibility. A new report's just come out saying that only 3% of, uh, of us live in places where civil society has the freedom to speak freely. So we need to speak for those who can't speak for themselves. And, and, I, and, I, and I think that these questions of asking ourselves and, and challenging our own policies is, is part of that. What are the values we stand for? And why are we still thinking about the world and politics in terms of rationality when actually what we're seeing is that emotionality is, is on the up, uprise. These violent extremist movements are tapping into visceral identity, right? And so we, if, if we want to think about that, we should also be understanding how do you take that on board? How do we take on identity and, 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 and so on. Um, and a couple of other things, uh, and I'll stop, is um, a lot of the discussions on the, on the, let's say, the left or the liberal side of, this, of, of the discourse, and I, being in the States, we see this very much, is that there's a lot of talk about diversity. But diversity has now become difference and difference is becoming division. As opposed to rethinking about it in terms of, yes, there's diversity, there's lots, you know, and it's beautiful in terms, of, in terms of how society can function, but diversity can lead to shared humanity and social cohesion. All of us want to celebrate the coming of the new year, and we all have rituals around how we deal with death and birth and, and, and um, uh, milestones in life and so forth. It's, there is a common or shared human experience out there, and yet we're, instead of looking at that, we're picking our, ourselves to bits and pieces and, and, and so forth and atomizing our societies. So I think we need to reframe and think about pluralism as a strength and bring that into the educational space. Why is it so hard to teach you know, Indian art and Persian art and West African art alongside, you know, British and West European and, 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 and other art. As, as to, so that our classrooms in, in places where our kids are mixed can see the beauty that comes from all different sides. And, and it kind of brings me, and I'm gonna end on a, on a positive note, that, that as I look at the world right now and, and I think about what is it that we can do, it's still, number one, we don't have the option of bowing out. Um, I think pessimism is, is really a privilege of the privileged, um, to just say I'm gonna go away and, and, and not deal with the world's problems. I certainly, for, for me, I, I'm constantly inspired by the women I work with and they have nowhere to go, right? It's their societies, the conflict that their, is at their door. So what is it that we can do? And what I'm looking at right now, and I welcome thoughts and questions and, 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 and also your ideas, is how do we get the best of each side? How do we get the best of the local bottom-up work and the, and the activism that's on the, on the ground together with how we shape and, and inform the global side of it so that it's actually moving in the direction of bringing peace and development and justice for people on the ground. Um, and, and with what we've started in the last two years is something called the She Builds Peace Campaign. It's now in 30 countries. And it's amazing. We, we've, we've kind of had a discourse, but we've said, go out and do what you need to do. And, you know, from Myanmar, Nigeria, Armenia, Cameroon, all sorts of places, people are going out and they're, um, they're bringing up the idea that citizens are peace builders and can be peace builders. And you can play a role in your own society as young people, as engaging with the police, engaging with politicians. And so there is a sense of taking, taking that kind of 
not just the responsibility, but feeling empowered and enabled, and then being connected to a global world out there. And, and this, this is one of the areas that, that um, I'm hoping that in the next year or so we will see more um, action and activity. And it's, again, whether it's margins or mainstream, I'm not sure, but it's certainly out there. And I welcome you to sort of follow what we're doing and, and, and um, join us if you want. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Sanam, for a very thought-provoking, depressing, but also <laughs> inspiring talk. Um, I've realized that we're out of time according to the schedule, but can we maybe just have two, two questions? I know some of you have to go to, to other, other panels, but if we have any burning questions, let's go with those. Yes, please. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for this uh, thought-provoking presentation. But uh, my question is that shouldn't we go to the root of the problem rather than continue on narrating the situation and talking about the processes? Uh, isn't this inevitable result or outcome of the neoliberal order where, um, uh, for example, the local elites get their legitimacy from the international elite rather than from the population of their country. It isn't, this, it isn't, isn't the war the result of the hybrid war, which is the result of neoliberalism where outsourcing the war and using cyber war and so on. The other point which really I, find, I found um, very difficult to put up with in your presentation, the moral authority of the international community what is the international community? Is Zimbabwe the international community or the same exploitive international elite and their, uh, their uh, media outlet? Is it, what is the moral authority, our moral authority? Is it, is, is it uh, Kipling's, one, the, white man, uh, the white man's burden? What, I, what kind of moral authority we are talking about? What is the liberal West, the liberal, the liberal order? How many people were killed as a result of this liberal order? Isn't this the result of the liberal order? Should we go to, to narrate these processes of the liberal order rather than to say the neoliberal order is the main cause of these catastrophes? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it was very important to solve some of my problems, my issues, but I still have the same issue as I had before. Okay, um, there was the Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan problem. Um, I'm from Portugal, we received a few girl musicians from an orchestra and we felt very good about it because we were helping the girls and another basketball team or whatever and we feel very good about it because we think we are helping a little group of women but what can we really do to help the ones that stay there they are at their country their country is governed by someone we don't like but Continuing from that uh, same question, what can we do? Are we going to invade Afghanistan again to force them to treat women the way we consider right? It's their culture. Are, are we to impose our? Of course, um, I'm European. I don't like the way women are treated in Afghanistan, but do I have the right to say, how women are supposed to be treated in another culture which is not my culture. The same in Ukraine. We, we received Ukrainians coming from refugees and we, f we feel very good about it, but it's the same question. Are we going to interfere in other culture, in other countries? Are we going to use the same weapons and arms and the same methods of war uh, to feel good about ourselves? This is 
Yes, a moral issue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my point was not that I say, I say that they have moral authority. What I'm saying is that the discourse, the, the framing that the Western governments give us is that they're always standing behind this notion that they have moral authority. So if you look at, if you look at what's happening, and that's, that's why I put this up, that, you know, that's Ukraine today, right? But all of those other conflicts, apart from Russia's war in Chechnya, all of that is Western. So, so it's, I'm, not, I've, I'm not saying that they, what I'm saying, I'm not saying that they have moral authority, I'm saying that they've been claiming moral authority, and the problem is that they have been also diminishing, whether they had it or not in the first place, they've certainly destroyed it in the last 20 years. That, that's, that's, it, it, the point again is that we can argue about whether they had it or not. My point is that in the last 20 years, whatever was there has been completely destroyed. And whether they had it or not, I think it's degrees because compared to whom and what, right? As a child who came out of the Iranian revolution, I certainly value the rights that I've had in this country to be able to speak and, and, and walk around and criticize whoever I want. There is a certain authority that comes with giving your citizens that right. But when you've diminished it by going and killing others, that's, that to me is, is, is the issue that, that, I've been, that I've been talking about. And as I say, as we, as we sit now in terms of why the world is, why we're so broken is that, is that everybody's pointing fingers at others. It's, so, it, it is. It's of course it is. Of course it is. But but it, it's what I, and and what I've been trying to say to you is that, and, and I'm sorry if I if it didn't come across is that this is the world we're in. There is on the margins or within that there has been 20 years of work by local people, who are taking on that responsibility to to change that environment and to have a voice, and they've done it locally. They've brought it into the international arena, and they have been consistently pushed back, basically, by our governments again. So I don't think you and I disagree. Um, on the question of Afghan, uh, uh, and to suggest that the Taliban represents the culture of Afghanistan, I think, is, is, is highly erroneous. Um, if you look at what's been happening in the last eight months on the ground there, Afghan women across the country have been protesting. They are out on the streets without a gun, without any protective gear, facing Taliban fighters, risking their lives. Many have been raped, many have been killed. Young girls who wanted to go to school are now in jail, or we don't know what's happened to them, because they have been out there fighting to get to school. So to suggest that, you know, these are our values and it's not their values, I think is, is, is very, very erroneous. And that's part of the, the, the discourse that our, I think part of our media and our politicians create because it's somewhat convenient to say, oh, well, the Taliban represents them and, and, and let them go. The Taliban came to power in the last 20 years when, when the NATO alliance was there under our governments and our security forces' eyes um, they be became stronger. When the United States left Bagram Airport in the middle of the night, they left all sorts of weapons and, and equipment and the Taliban picked them up. So, whose values are we talking about here? And, and what did, you know, again, what is our collective responsibility as the international community vis-a-vis -vis the population of a country, and I mentioned earlier, that is 62% under the age of 25, they're kids. They're kids. And systematically, these women, Afghan women, activists, peace builders, politicians, judges, you name it, for years they were saying, let us into the rooms where the discussions are being held. Our future is being discussed in Doha. And our governments, Western governments, and the United Nations kept them out. So, um, do we have a responsibility to the girls and to the, to the ones that, I think we do. I think we do because, because we left them, we created an environment which is so horrific. And, and at the moment, either, we have to do two things, I think. One is where we have leverage left, we have to be engaging with the Taliban to, to get them to incrementally, you know, to improve their behavior, right? Otherwise, 
we're giving everything and we're leaving generations behind. And secondly, those people who are stuck in transit places. We have Afghans who got, were sent to Ukraine. We have Afghans who were sent to Uganda, all sorts of places as lily pads, as transit spots before resettlement because the UK government promised them resettlement visas. The Canadians promised it. I, I don't know what, how much Portugal promised or not, but we're leaving them behind. We've just left them. It's, it's, we're, we're ignoring the fact that they are basically being left in limbo. So I think there is a sense of responsibility that we should have towards those people. And what's interesting is that it's been, an, it's been a period where those of us who are coming at it from a peace building side and, and you know, women's rights uh, activism, and those who come from a military side have come together because they, they understood that it was overwhelmingly Afghans who were doing the nation building, fighting the fight against terrorism, and actually helping our soldiers, our Western soldiers who were there all these years. And we've left these people behind. So, so there, is a, there is a certain sense of, I think, um, responsibility that we have. And, and, but I beg you, please don't assume that, that, uh, that the Taliban uh, represents either the culture, because as I say, the girls and young women are, and, and their families want them to go to school, um, or the religion actually, because Islam, the, one of the first tenets of Islam is that everybody has to be educated. So, so I'm not sure where they're getting their ideas from, but it's certainly not from, from the Quran. Thank you. Well, I wish we could go on for longer, and I'm sure there are other questions, but we are unfortunately out of time. So, so please join me in thanking Sanam again for an excellent talk.